Okay, 1835, Alirio Helvez from Colombia. Okay, e4. So let's play, let's play traditional, let's play e5. Okay, knight c3. So this could be a lot of different things. Our move is knight f6. This could be the Vienna. Okay, no, it's knight f3, it's the four knights. Knight c6 and the four knight scotch. So this is interesting. We're actually facing a four knight scotch, which uh, is, is quite rare. We're usually on the other end of it. Now I'll show you guys a line which is a little bit less uh, well known than the main line, but which I think is uh, no worse. This is actually what I play in my over the board games and my in my actual blitz games. So as as you know, we play e takes d4 here. And who can remind me what the main move is after knight takes d4? So what is the most popular move in this position? The move that is recommended in most books, in most videos, it's the move bishop f8 to b4. Yeah. So the development of the bishop to b4, and that leads to the main line with knight takes c6 and then bishop d3, etc. But the move that I like is bishop c5, which might strike you as even more natural, but it is not the main move. It's, it's the second most popular move, and it's very reputable, but it's not actually as popular as bishop b4, and some people don't know it quite as well. And I like to choose my repertoire and build it around these moves that are not sidelines, but not quite the most popular move to make it a little bit less likely that my opponent knows what to do. So knight takes c6. Obviously not DC, which would allow the queen trade and would get our king deprived of castling rights and ruin our structure. We play BC in these positions. And bishop g5. So bishop g5 is one of many possible moves. Nothing particularly special about it. One thing to understand is that white isn't really threatening e5 at this point for many reasons. One of which is that if we castle, which is what we're going to do, e5 can be met with rook f8 to e8, right? And we pin the pawn, and because white is so underdeveloped, there's no way that he's going to keep this pawn alive. And then on the next move, we can play d6 in order to prevent e5 once and for all. But as long as white has not developed the bishop, you don't need to worry about e5 being a thing. Okay, now e5 is kind of a thing. So do we go h6? A lot of people wonder, like, do we throw this and how do I know? Now, in many cases, it doesn't really matter. In this particular instance, I like throwing an h6, and there is a specific reason for that. And the reason for that is that after we go d6 and then we go rook e8, we have potentially the possibility of winning the e4 pawn by playing g5, right? So I kind of like that concept. Okay, so rook e8 is good. We can also go queen e7 and then try to get the queen to the center with e5, queen e5. Many ways of playing such a position. But I like traditional move, rook e8. Let's play it old school. This is like very old school. Bishop f3. Okay, so at this point, we already have a very interesting possibility of going g5. And then meeting g bishop g3 with g4. And after bishop e2, actually taking that pawn on e4, which is quite risky, but also very, very interesting. And one thing that I want to prove to you as we hit 1800 is that on the one hand, king safety is the most important phenomenon and it's the most important factor in any position. On the other hand, you shouldn't always worry all that much about pushing pawns in front of your own king. And what I will try to show you here, hopefully I will get away with this, is that just because you've pushed pawns in front of your king doesn't mean that your opponent is automatically going to checkmate you. So let's go through this line, g4, bishop e2, and we're going to snag the pawn on e4. And I'm going to try to prove to you that our king is essentially in no danger. Whoa, e5. That is not a move I expected. And I don't think it's a particularly good move. It might avoid material losses, but I think it gives us a very nice endgame potentially. So what should we do? Should we take on e5 or should we take the bishop? Let's not get disoriented. I don't get disoriented. What does e5 actually accomplish? Well, it opens the bishop's diagonal and threatens bishop takes c6. So we should definitely take the bishop. Okay, now um, the brazen move would be f takes g2, but leaving this pawn on f6 is perhaps a little bit too brazen even for me. I, I wouldn't want to leave this pawn on f6 because it creates the potential for a lobster pincer mate. Um, let's play it safe. And let's play queen takes f6. Let's get rid of that pawn, get a good position. Let's not bother with BS. Queen takes f3. And this is what I meant when I said we're going to get a good endgame. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to trade queens, absolutely. The white's kingside pawn structure is ruined. 
Uh, you could say that our queenside pawn structure is ruined, but our queenside pawn structure is quite compact, whereas the kingside structure is just terrible. Now we need to develop actively, right? We need to figure out where white wants to put, put his pieces, and we need to develop accordingly. But I think a lot of you are tempted by bishop h3, but that's actually not uh, a great move. That's a step in the wrong direction because it allows the rook to get active, rook fe1, which is something that white wants to do anyway. And if you look very carefully at what white wants to do, you'll notice that the c3 knight has a very nice square on e4. Why is that a nice square? Well, because it's centralized, it's anchored by a pawn, and the knight threatens to jump into f6. So the way that we want to develop to stop that is by going bishop f5. Yeah, bishop f5 stops knight e4. d5 would hang c7. I didn't want to give up a pawn. In general, d5 would be preferable, but in this case, we can develop while preventing knight e4 and also while attacking c2. Okay, our opponent does it anyway, just giving up a pawn. Obviously, we will take it, and now we have control over the e-file as well. So we, we don't want to trade on e1. I think some people would make you know the mistake of thinking, oh, I can simplify, right? But, but simplify on your own terms. Um, and how do you set up your own terms? f5 is a tempting move. That's f5 is possible, but I don't see the point of playing f5 in light of the fact that we can double rooks on e8 and keep control of the e-file. Thank you, Costa card. Okay, so this is an interesting moment, right? We can trade all, all of the rooks. We can trade four, pair, four rooks. Is that bishop endgame winning? Well, probably it is, right? Bishop endgames up a pawn are often winning, but they're not comparable to pawn endgames. So I've, I've encountered bishop endgames like that, which are not easily winning. So I would find a middle ground here, and I would say, okay, if White really wants to trade rooks, we can let him do it. But it, while White is busy trading rooks and going rook one, we are going to improve our position. Now, in the context of an endgame, what does it mean to improve your position? Well, it basically means bringing your king up. That's the top priority. Let's go king g7 and get this king up into the center, f5 or maybe e6, d5. And if our opponent makes a draw in that bishop endgame, congratulations, right? But at least we're going to make improving moves while our opponent is busy trading rooks. Hopefully that logic makes sense. Okay, so now we're going to trade. We have no, I mean, f5 is possible, but then white can go f3. I don't see the point in dilly-dallying any further. Okay, so now this is a very instructive moment, actually, because it's very easy to miss an opportunity to play a good move here. If you look carefully at the bishop, right, white wants to play the move c2, c3. Why, what is that going to accomplish? Well, what that's going to accomplish is it's going to keep the bishop essentially confined on this diagonal. Why? Because, well, the bishop can't really escape, and you can't really go d5 and bishop d6 because c7 is going to hang. So you currently have an opportunity to get this bishop into the center, but this opportunity may never occur again because white wants to play c3. Now, maybe our opponent doesn't play c3, but we shouldn't operate under that assumption. I like the move bishop c5 to d4. And if c3 happens, we can reroute the bishop into the center with bishop e5. And hopefully that makes more sense. Now you might say, wait a minute, after bishop e5 there, doesn't white have the move f4? And he does, but f4 is actually more harmful than it is good because it pushes the pawn out to a dark square. Okay, king e2, wow. Now this allows us to transition into a pawn endgame. And most pawn endgames up a pawn are going to be winning. This one, I think, is probably no exception. I mean, it's I wouldn't be 100% sure that it's winning, but I, I'm sort of 90% sure that it's winning. Yeah, we're just going to trade. I mean, I, I'm my intuition is telling me that despite, despite the fact that our pawn structure is kind of ruined here, nonetheless, I like, I like our chances here. Now, our top priority right now is obviously to get our king into the center. That is... And this is very fitting because I'm currently doing a series on pawn game, so I better prove my mettle. Okay, so now we need to figure out first and foremost what the potential for us is to create pass pawns. And what I see is that we have the, the potential of going c5 followed by d5 and d4. So we don't have to worry about white's king heading toward the king's side, right? We don't have to worry about that because the moment that white goes king g4, we will play c5, and we will initiate the process of creating a passed pawn. Okay, there we go. We're going to go c5. Now, in the video, I have this rule about pushing the perspective passer, which is the d-pawn. This is a slight exception to the rule because it's a very unusual structure, 
Very unusual structure. If you go d5, you will be subject to a deep freeze. Black, white is going to go b4, and then you're not going to be able to go c5. Normally, these pawns aren't doubled, so that's not a problem. So now we go d5, and there isn't even a pawn race to speak of. The game is over. We're just going to go d4. White has gone completely wrong off the rails here. And our opponent didn't stop to ask himself how black can create pass pawns. He just sort of assumed that we can't do it. And, and so I don't think he put any amount of thought into this idea. Okay, we can just go king e4. It doesn't really matter. We're obviously going to win the pawn race. There really isn't even a pawn race. By the time white wins f7, we're, we're going to be promoting our pawn. And if you want to be super clinical about it, after king g7, you can even play the move f5. Like you can, if you want, not even give up, not even give up a single pawn. And if white goes g4, then you play f takes g4 and the f pawn isn't even going anywhere. Then we have like trousers, but both pawns are unstoppable. f5 is, is clinical. Now we go d3. And g4, we can take it. And the hilarious thing is after f5, we can push either of our passers, right? We can play g3 because we promote with check, or the simpler option is to go d2, d1 queen. And I know some beginner players struggle with these types of situations. There is a lab more laborious way of winning this, and there's an easier way of winning this particular position, right? The easy way is to basically say, okay, I'm gonna give up my queen for the pawn, and then I'm gonna promote my other pawn. But if you wanna be super clinical, you need to use the technique that is uh, essentially imagine that there was nothing left on the board except a queen in this pawn, then the position would be drawn because of stalemate concepts. Here, you don't have to worry about stalemate concepts. So you actually don't have to give up your queen for the pawn. You can use your queen to essentially shepherd the, the white king off of the pawn. So a, a, a good, solid, kind of simple positional game. And we're, we're winning more of these as we hit, you know, 1800. So yeah, bishop c5 is a good is a good line if you're if you're an e5 player. Knight c knight takes c6 is one of many possibilities. Bishop e3 being another possibility. Bishop e3 is another possibility. Um, and I believe the most popular line. There is also knight f5. There's also knight f5 here. So this is a theoretical line. You can you can do some research yourself. Um, okay, so takes takes bishop g5 is again one of many possible variations bishop d3 is the main line bishop d3 is the most popular move and then the line goes d6 and this is the main difference between putting the bishop on c5 and, and putting it on b4 like when you put the bishop on b4 you're basically not i mean d6 is a move here but d5 is what almost everybody plays when you put the bishop on c5 on the other hand you're going for d6 so in any case bishop g5 is a move so we castle bishop e2, we throw an h6, and I think bishop e2 is already inaccurate. I think our opponent didn't realize that the e4 pawn constitutes a, a pretty serious weakness here. And I think that had he known that, he would have played bishop d3, which sort of supports the pawn. So we go h6, we go rook e8, we go d6, we go rook e8, we make all the typical moves. And bishop f3 is probably a mistake, assuming that this is objectively sound. And I think it is objectively sound. What about h6, e5? Well, h6, e5 just loses a pawn. Takes, takes, takes. We just win a pawn, like at the end of the day. And e5 is never dangerous. So how should white have played here? I don't actually know. I mean, at this point, white has a very hard time keeping this pawn. White has a very hard time keeping this pawn. Maybe a move like king h1 would be best. You know, this is a grandmaster move. Your bishop d3, I mean, king h1 is interesting because after g5, bishop g3, knight e4, the idea is to win back the pawn with bishop f3, although here there's rook d4 attacking the queen. So this all looks pretty nasty. Um, Min suggests bishop d3 kind of apologizing for playing bishop e2 initially. And this is actually transposed into a, a line that has 10 games in the database. Bishop b4, f4. I think this might even be Sevi and Caruana from the US Championship. So bishop d3 was best. Um, of course, lol, back to pushing all the pawns in front of my king after this game. So e5 is sort of, sort of, uh, makes our job easy. Bishop e2, we play knight takes e4. Yeah. And, and like this position is a classic situation where, yeah, we've pushed all these pawns in front of our king, but 
how is white actually going to 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 exploit that right i i ask this question so often in lessons when i have like a student says oh i don't like this because of x y and z um okay but how is white going to attack like give me a move right now you might say okay bishop d3 big whoop you just come back with your rook then you can move your queen into g5 and if anything black can be the one to attack on the king side you're going to go h5 h4 and this bishop is going to be in trouble the white bishop belongs on d3 like that is our one of our opponent's main mistakes is not to put it there um does that make sense like queen d2 you can even go queen g5 here okay i guess i guess bishop f4 is quite annoying but no i would absolutely play it over the board queen f6 i would absolutely play it over the board that's the point I mean, I was a little bit skeptical initially, but now that I have myself played these moves on the board, um, I've realized that it's totally fine for black. Now, white should probably play bishop takes g4. But what I was thinking about doing here is either going queen g5 immediately or snapping off this bishop first, get rid of the dark squared bishop, and then get the queen to g5. And black has a very dynamic position. I mean, you're threatening queen takes g3. You've got a nice bishop. Black has absolutely no problems here despite having a bad pawn structure. And pawn structure is the most visually apparent aspect of the position, but not necessarily the most important one. Um, so anyways, our opponent didn't opt for that and instead opted for e5. And we had this big trade, queen f3, queen f3, gf. So bishop f5, very important move. Very important move. Uh, stopping knight e4. Our opponent played it anyway, giving up a pawn. Just sort of tilting here. Rook a8, so we double on the, on the e-file. We got our king up. And I just want to get to the get to the uh, pawning. And this is a very important move. Right? This is the kind of move that you know it's hard to play unless you're very experienced in the end game, because it can be hard to to tell even why it's bad that your bishop is sort of trapped here. But the reason it's bad is because it's it, like what are you going to do with this bishop? It, it has to remain between b6 and c5 for basically the rest of the game. Uh, and it's it's very important for the bishop to have more mobility. So bishop, bishop d4, c3, bishop e5. Was a b3 a bad way to save the b2 pawn? No, I mean, b3 is possible. But then we get our king up to f6. And then we get it up to f5. And then we play bishop e5. So this is all pretty bad for white. And if white had gone f4, we simply drop back to f6. Yeah, maybe you can get the king to d7 there. But it's, it's very cumbersome. And now this is winning for black. Because this pawn is an incredible weakness. I mean, it's incredibly weak. And, and we can attack it in a variety of ways by getting the bishop to either d6. Now you can play d5. The white bishop is no longer making contact with the c7 pawn. And you're just going to get your bishop to d6. And you're going to grind white down here. You can create a pass pawn la later. This is definitely winning. So our opponent traded bishops or allowed the bishops to get traded. How could white have made a draw? I don't think white could have made a draw. I think this is a win for black. But we, we'll check with the engine. I'm not positive. But I, I'm, I, I think this is a win for black. Now, white should have kept the king in the center. I mean, white's only chance is to keep the king in the center and try to prevent black from creating a passer. But ultimately, I don't even think that you can help prevent black from making a passer. And if white plays f4 check, and th this gets into some very instructive pawn endgame concepts, which I'll delve into into later videos. But f4, for example, is a big mistake. And a lot of people would play this thinking, oh, I'm just going to push Black's king away with g4. But again, the deep free, well, not really the deep freeze, but freezing the g4 pawn. And g3 is a weakness. Now, people don't think of endgames as, like, you don't think of weaknesses in pawn endgames, but that's a thing. Like, you can have a big weakness in a pawn endgame, and now g3 is a very serious weakness, which can tie down white's king. Uh, did you consider play bishop d4 before you trade the queens? Let me see. Let me rewind. Yeah, bishop d4 is fine. But why give up the pawn? Like, why why allow queen takes c6, right? And also, I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to, for, for white, of course, to, to ruin white's pawn structure. No, the pawn end game is losing for white. I'm, I'm positive. The more I look at this, the more positive I am that white is losing. Just because um, th no matter what, what white does, black has this plan of pushing c5 and d5 and d4 and creating a passer. Well, you can't really... 
you can Zugzwang this because like Black has a series of moves that improves his position. Right? Zugzwang happens when you don't have any moves available that improve your position. Here Black has a clear plan. Now we'll check the engine, but I can almost I can bet you a silver dollar that this pawn endgame is winning for Black. So g5, g4 is best. You can see that the engine. Oh, bishop f3 actually is best. What's up, Mr. Lama? What if white plays b4? Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. So e5 is bad. Yeah, bishop e2 is best. And actually, what we talked about, bishop takes g4, and the position is about equal. The position is about equal. And you can see queen g5 is one of the moves. So. Oh, so this is what we analyzed. Sorry, sorry. So white played e5. This is bad. Yeah, so fg is the computer move here. FG, I knew it was possible to play fg, but I didn't want to, to risk it, right? The computer wants us to play like this and allow the f6 pawn to be defended. And why, why be crazy, right? I mean, we just take f6. We have a great position. And minus two. I mean, white's position sucks. So we played really well here. And bishop d4 is good. But king f6 also is possible. So the engine eval is only like minus one. There's a discrepancy between the eval in the game review and in the the actual analysis. So let's see. No, it's winning. It's winning. Um, the engine move is b4, which Mr. Lama suggested, which is best. That deep freezes the pawns, by the way. Classic example of a deep freeze. But after king f5, no, it's winning. F3 or what a king F3, H5. You're going to grind white down one way or another. So I would invite you guys to actually analyze this on your own. To use an engine and, and, and set up this end game in a chess.com analysis board and figure out why black is winning. Now, this is going to be the subject of a later video. Basically, the reason that black is winning here is because the black king is, is, is going to make inroads by force. White is going to run out of pawn moves. Like c5, you can see bc, dc, a5. White is going to run out of pawn moves. And eventually the king's going to have to go to the side. And then black's king starts making inroads. And this is a classic idea. And the, 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 the king is going to make its way to f3. And then black is going to create a passer by pushing this f-pawn up to f4. Destroying the g3 pawn. And then you're going to have an outside passer. So there is... A lot to unpack in this end game, but I'm really tired, guys. I'm going to call it a night. Um, so you're welcome to do some more analysis on your own. I'll, I'll give Hannah a raid. I'll see you guys later. And thanks for hanging out, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.